Okay. I'll spend the next 10 minutes um, just trying to talk about a topic that was assigned to me, um, AI-enabled whole, whole heart evaluation. I won't spend a lot of time on uh, the algorithms because I think that they, you know, five years ago that was new, but I think now it's the application of the algorithms and to how, how you can actually use it clinically. And so these are the four uh, topics that I'll cover, sort of the all-in-one coronary disease evaluation. I'll talk about how we can use sort of what we know to be true, but what our clinician colleagues in the office don't necessarily know so well, and to try to translate the information for them so to make it uh, clinically actionable. Um, show you some data on the performance of the AI today, and then talk about uh, a couple of near-term uh, future directions. And so, you know, this is a picture from now 18 years ago um, from a 64 slice CT scanner. It's gotten a lot better. Now we've got these photon counting detector CTs that have about 160 micron isotropic resolution. So it's getting to the point where non-invasively we'll be able to replicate what we see uh, with IVIS. And, you know, it's quick, um, it's low dose, it's low cost. And the evolution of the field of CT was really in the first five years after the introduction of 64 slice CT to go after stenosis and to try to prove that we could identify narrowing. I think in 2010 to 15, there was a transition and people wanted to see whether or not you could determine ischemia. And then since 2015, there's been an increase in the interest in atherosclerosis. And that makes sense to me. Atherosclerosis is the primary disease and uh, stenosis and ischemia are simply um, secondary and tertiary anatomic and physiologic consequences of that atherosclerosis. So, but I think something that would be helpful is if you could just do it all. Um, so, you know, what, what you see here on the right is the list of all these things that are, are, are associated with future adverse patient outcomes. And so, whether it's um, prediction of major adverse cardiac events, ischemia, rapid di disease progression or medication non-response, all of these features have been shown to contribute significantly. It sounds like a lot, and it's certainly more than, you know, a single variable, but the good news is that they're all overlapping. So the things that predict heart attacks are the same things that predict rapid progression are the same things that predict ischemia and so on. And so then the question is, like, how do we um, get, get that information and use it clinically? So this is a, um, a workstation, right? This is the way we typically read CT scans. You get um, curved multiplanar reformats and spin around and visually estimate with subjective and semi-quantitative approaches. And then with the AI now, what you can do is uh, truly quantitative imaging, right? So non-invasively, uh, what you see here is the LAD. It's spun around in different angles. And then you can see the cross-section really identifies all of the different, how, how many forms of atherosclerosis there really are. And in addition to that, how it remodels the vessel, how it encroaches upon the lumen, and then how it also causes ischemia as well. So, you know, the, just to take you through what the AI can do is instead of um, eyeballing estimates of stenosis, what it can identify is automatically determine the lesions within a coronary vessel and then automatically identify the first slice where it's normal, proximal to the lesion, and the distal slice immediately distal where it's uh, normal as well to the lesion. And then that can give you very quantitative measures where you can start to look at the artery in 3D, so every single uh, wall of the artery simultaneously, but you can also start to get all of the quantitative measures of percent diameter, percent area, stenosis, minimum luminal diameters and areas, as well as vascular remodeling. And all of this information then can be curated on a patient, a vessel, a segment, and down to the lesion basis uh, for all these measures uh, that we're interested in. Once you do that, then you can start to then um, look not beyond the luminal narrowing at the atherosclerosis itself. And here you can do, you know, again, at the patient vessel segment uh, lesion level, a very comprehensive assessment of atherosclerosis, whether you talk about plaque burden by volume, by area, by mass. Um, you can look at plaque compositions both on a relative scale and with some of the spectral imaging, you can get absolute material densities. Um, look at plaque location, diffuseness, and then at least in the field of CT, there's this definition of high-risk plaques um, that can be easily identified. And then all of that data can also be curated over here as well. And that curation looks something like this, right? So over here on the left, you see all the things related to the artery. And on the right, you can see all of the things related to the atherosclerosis. 
at the patient, the vessel, the segment level. And then you can see that the, um, the software allows you then to just download it as an Excel spreadsheet, and you can start doing research so that you don't have to manually curate any of this data at all. So then the question becomes, how do you use it clinically, right? So at least uh, when I practiced at New York Presbyterian Hospital, nobody understand, understood the imaging unless you were an imager, and virtually nobody was going to go through all these numbers. And so at least what we did was we tried to translate that into something that would be clinically actionable. And so all of those numbers are now visualized in infographic form and pictorial form so that with a single bird's eye view, you understand you know, what the atherosclerosis is, what the stenosis is, ischemia, some scoring systems, and then to make it fully interactive too, right, so that you don't have to go find the images, you just simply press on an area that worries you and you can dive in deep and understand at the segment, the vessel, the lesion level, uh, what is the breakdown of the type of atherosclerosis that there is, and then what are the measures of stenosis severity in a fully interactive platform where you can spin around in 360 degrees and you can do submillimeter coronary mapping using this, uh, this radial axial tool. And then if you don't know how to read a CT scan, the computer automatically points arrows to areas of interest where as long as you can read, you should be able to interpret the CT scan um, because the, the legend tells you what it is. And then at least for the preventive cardiologists, like, you know, there was a lot of interest in atherosclerosis because that really sort of helped us understand like that it's these non-calcified plaques that were the bad actors and that once you became more and more bright, dense um, calcium, that that was actually a, a, a sign of stabilization of disease. And then so what the computer can now tell you is exactly how many segments have um, plaque and the type of plaque. What is the percent atheroma volume, the total plaque volume? It can give you a population-based age and gender-based um, normative values, so you can understand the percentile for age and gender. And then you can start to dive deep into the, each artery, where you can see over here, this, there's nothing around stenosis here. It's all around atherosclerosis. And if somebody has this positive arterial remodeling and they have this... Um, this low density plaque, which is depicted over here in red, that this uh, lesion is a high risk uh, lesion, um, portending a poor prognosis for this patient. And so then, like if you wanted to then come out and say, okay, well maybe this person needs to go to the cath lab, what you can see here is that the computer will automatically tell you where this, uh, how many severe and moderate stenoses there are. It'll also, by vascular territory, tell you how many mild stenoses, moderate, severe and chronic total occlusions. Or if you come down here, you can look at all 18 coronary artery segments and look at the relative percent diameter stenosis, the minimum luminal diameters, the normal reference diameters. And if you click on any bar, you can interact with it. So now you understand all of the things related to luminal narrowing, to lesion length, to normal reference diameters. And then you can spin around in this in 360 degrees as well. So you have some idea of the kind of stent that you might be able to use for this procedure and how you might approach this lesion. So once you have all of this quantitative measurements that you, you got directly from the scan, um, if you think about it, you've got now everything related to the lumen, everything related to the vessel volume, and everything in between is related to the atherosclerosis or the plaque buildup. So all of this information that we have quantitatively, you can then feed into another mathematical algorithm and then ask this algorithm whether or not there's ischemia or not. And so that looks something like this, right, where the halos around each artery and each branch are the ones that are ischemic. Um, and then if you, what I like about this approach is that it, you not only know whether or not there's ischemia, but if you hit this ischemia tab, now you understand why there is ischemia. Because, you know, there's a concept that people talk about a lesion-specific ischemia. There's no such thing as a lesion-specific ischemia because the ischemia comes from the ostium of the vessel all the way to the distal portion, and it's what affects the myocardium. So in this case where you have somebody with uh, diffuse disease and a number of different lesions, you can start to interrogate every single lesion and understand which ones you'd want to intervene on in order to try to improve that ischemia back to normal flow. And then you can also get these sort of scores, right? The radiologists tend to use the CAD-RAD score, which is both for acute and stable symptoms, but that's automatically generated for you as well. And I think the greatest leap forward is going to be in quantitative disease tracking, 
right? So in all of the studies to date, what we found is that in patients undergoing serial CT, if you stop new disease progression, the patient's prognosis is better. But in addition to that, like in addition to stopping new disease, what we also found was that the transformation of plaque morphology, i.e., a reduction in the non-calcified plaque because it's transforming to brighter calcified plaques is a sign of stabilization and associated with long-term reductions in major adverse cardiovascular events. So these two goals of like proving to somebody over time that their medical therapy and lifestyle is stopping disease and stabilizing the pre-existing disease, I think is a very personalized approach and quantitative that you can use to, um, to assess the efficacy of, of therapies. And then I think that what we, we found, at least at New York Presbyterian, is that nobody understood these, these reports, right? They're automatically generated, they're in accordance with the societal guidelines, and nobody really appreciated the importance of the data that was there. And so over here, what we also do is generate a one-page report that's juxtaposed to all these annotated, automatically annotated uh, images um, of each artery so that people can just look at a single page. And then what we found that was the most effective in promoting compliance was really to provide about a 25-page book to each patient that was written at a fifth grade reading level so that every patient could be empowered by the data that came out of their personalized scan. And so just going to the last section of validation of this, like, you know, we're working with a number of folks, including folks here in this room, like uh, Dr. Mintz, uh, who's working with Dr. Lansky at Yale University to do a number of multi-center clinical validation studies. Mm -hmm. Here are some of the studies that have been published to date, um, comparing this AI-enabled approach against expert readers, invasive angiography, intravascular ultrasound, uh, infrared X, and then also invasive fractional flow reserve. The OCT analyses are ongoing right now. What was interesting is that there was an 86% um, accuracy against a high-grade stenosis against cath, um, but in those discordances, actually, the AI-enabled tools had higher concordance to invasive FFR uh, than QCA did. And then, remember, we talked about that ischemia algorithm. Uh, we've tested that as well. So here's in the Credence trial that was interrogated with about 868 invasive FFR measurements in Pacific, which was 612, tried to compare the diagnostic accuracy as well as the discriminatory capability with area under the curve uh, with FFR, CT, and SPECT. And what you can see is that it performs um, well um, as compared to an invasive gold standard as compared to other non-invasive methods that we have available to us today. And I think this is important, like the rates of non-evaluability uh, where you have to send a scan back and say you can't do it have to be pretty low. And so um, here it's generally pretty low. Um, it's on par with SPECT and, and PET as well. And then prognostication of the outcomes, right? We need to know that this actually is clinically meaningful. So here on this left side is a 750 patient study, one year follow-up and then a 300 patient 10-year retrospective follow-up demonstrating that you can indeed find patients who are sick um, based on just, um, at, in this case, it was total plaque volume. We have enrolled about 12,000 patients uh, from about 25 sites that have four-year outcomes and we'll start publishing on that later this year. So then the, just the future, like a couple of the things that we're working on is that, you know, somebody having a 70% stenosis and ischemia um, in a vessel that subtends 2% of the myocardium is very different than somebody who has a 70% stenosis and ischemia in some, a vessel that subtends 15% of the myocardium. So having this percent subtended myocardium I think is going to be important. There is an emerging uh, database of, of studies that are looking at inflammation around the vessel, so pericoronary adipose tissue, and sort of looking at that as a sign of um, perivascular inflammation. I think that will be added to the toolbox sometime soon. So just in the last slide here, I'll conclude by saying this AI-enabled whole heart evaluation. Now we can really do rapid and accurate all-in-one coronary disease assessment for atherosclerosis, vascular morphology, and ischemia. I think it's really going to be important for us to help educate our clinicians, our referring clinicians, to help them understand how to use this clinically rather than from a research standpoint. But I do think that because you have such quantitative data, you can effectively deploy it in clinical practice as well as in large-scale clinical trials. And then now I think we're starting to go beyond the coronaries into these additional non-coronary features that will enhance coronary artery disease assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Min. And the second speaker will be uh, Dr. Granada. <clears throat> and his topic is uh, Structural Hot Innovation, Barriers and Opportunities. Yeah, thank you uh, <clears throat> again for the uh, kind invitation and being the only talk on uh, devices. You know, what I decided to do is essentially provide a high level overview of uh, the structural field and where the uh, field is uh, moving forward. Uh, one of the main questions uh, that, you know, we get um, asked uh, a lot on the uh, innovation field is why the structural space is so important. And the main reason, a simple way, is because all the structural hard conditions uh, present or evolve into heart failure. And being one of the most expensive um, conditions uh, to treat uh, in the United States and actually uh, overall in the world, this has the potential for the first time to treat these patients uh, with devices and actually change the uh, natural history of disease and potentially actually uh, become more financially uh, efficient. I'm going to skip the uh, TAVR world because TAVR right now is in an iteration uh, phase more than an innovation uh, phase. And I'm going to go straight into uh, mitral uh, innovation. And one of the things is um, this is a very particular condition because uh, besides surgery, we already have transcatheter technologies that uh, have very good uh, data. Uh, such as actually MitroClip. But one of the uh, uh, biggest questions that actually, um, you know, we face and everybody asks about is, you know, why, we do, why do we need actually further innovation in the mitral space? And, and, you know, one of the reasons is because most of these patients, a lot of these patients that actually present with mitral regurgitation are not actually good candidates for uh, uh, TIER, uh, MitroClip or actually Pascal, you know, uh, a lot of these patients have a lot of heterogeneous anatomy, including severe MAC, calcified leaflets, multi, multiple regurgitation uh, jets, and actually leaflet abnormalities that pretty much exclude these patients from uh, this particular technology. There is actually a lot of effort trying to reclassify uh, mitral regurgitation, and I really like this paper because in the way they conceptualize it, they're moving you know, away from the classic you know, definition of mitral regurgitation or stenosis, and now they're actually calling it mitral valve dysfunction in patients with annular calcification. And again, calcification becomes actually the center of attention uh, in the mitral space as well. Which is actually interesting is these patients actually um, are very, very common, very commonly seen, particularly actually women with chronic kidney disease, with concomitant aortic stenosis, with a small annular size, which is actually one of the contraindications for mitroclip, significant leaflet compromise, uh, therefore not a good anatomy for actually tear, and typically rejected from surgery. So this population, which is actually very common, is actually becoming a very important target for catheter-based mitral uh, uh, innovation. And this is one of the examples and technologies right now are getting to the point in which are becoming, you know, very sophisticated and have all achieved actually a, a biological and technological proof of principle. This is um, one of the first, uh, or actually was the first case that was done in the, the U.S with one of these uh, percutaneous uh, technologies, and as you can actually see here, now is absolutely viable to replace the valve completely via um, a catheter, you know, with a, um, a small incision in the groin, go transeptally, and essentially um, the device is essentially uh, delivered in a very, very simple and safe way. And right now we have uh, data with multiple devices that have achieved these uh, biological and technological proof of principle. So in the mitral space, innovation is actually leaning more towards actually replacement, but primarily is because the easy of implantation, because it's agnostic to the etiology of MR, reliably actually eliminate MR, and has less recurrence of MR, but they are actually significant challenges as well. And one of the biggest challenges is the high rejection rate in real world cases, mainly because anatomical reasons, because annular size uh, is actually too large or too small, because the risk of LVOT obstruction, because some of these devices are actually very bulky and protrude into the ventricle, the presence of actually MAC, or uh, the inability to deliver these uh, devices uh, uh, transeptally. But technology continues to evolve, and new generation technologies, you know, continue to essentially bring new attributes that actually are allowing to treat more patients, and all these issues are actually becoming less and less and less, you know, uh, over time. 
In the way that actually I see uh, TMVR versus Tabor is like a one achieved a landing on the moon and actually TMVR is actually aiming to essentially land in Mars. And the final goal has to be transeptal uh, delivery as it happened in the aortic field, but at least four important components need to happen before these technologies can be generalized. The first is we need to redefine the target population and atomical requirements, because right now surgical is the standard of care and we also have patients that benefit from uh, uh, tier uh, as well. We need to actually come up with designs that are more adaptable to annular size and anatomical variability. These devices have to really perform in real world anatomies, especially in the presence of uh, uh, MAC and we need actually low profile, high performance delivery systems and the field continues to evolve towards actually achieving all these goals. Moving into tricuspid, uh, I really think this is perhaps one of the most um, intense uh, fields in innovation with more than actually 40 companies working uh, in the field trying to do different things, most of them trying to replicate what the surgeons actually have done in the past from annuloplasty devices to coaptation enhancement technologies valves that actually are orthotopic and atherotopic, and many other innovations in this uh, field. One of the biggest issues with all the repair technologies is being that achieve a total resolution of uh, tricuspid regurgitation is actually pretty incomplete, and in most of the studies, approximately 50% being actually conservative of the patients actually um, um, remain with a tricuspid regurgitation that is moderate or more. Now, what is actually interesting is in the same studies, a significant improvement in quality of life has been seen. So now we have this debate between heart failure physicians and interventionalists and regulators and payers, whether actually improving symptoms and quality of life is enough, you know, to show the feasibility and, perform, and measure the performance of these technologies on the right side. The tricuspid replacement field is actually um, even uh, more interesting and more aggressively pursued, mainly because it's actually easy and essentially abolishes completely the level of tricuspid regurgitation. But these patients require intense anticoagulation, and one of the things that actually have been reported in the uh, few randomized studies that have been done is the increased number of actually bleeding complications and actually also pacemaker rates um, that are actually pretty high, around 10% in these uh, patients following replacement. So, you know, there is now this controversy right now um, whether actually repair being actually safer is actually perhaps better than a full uh, replacement, and this will uh, continue until we have randomized uh, comparative studies. Moving actually into the treatment of a heart failure, in this new field that now we call interventional uh, heart failure, this is perhaps an area in which innovation has really exploded in three particular areas. Number one is the development of intracardiac shunts, and this is one of the um, shunts that were recently presented at THT that I find to be very innovative, which is a left atrium coronary sinus shunt to be able to relieve and decrease the left atrial pressure with very interesting first-in-human data. The second group of technologies is what actually um, enhance uh, essentially diuresis by uh, increasing the hemodynamics or modulating the hemodynamics of the, uh, of the kidney. In this particular system, the aortic system is being used in patient patients with decompensated heart failure and cardiorenal syndrome with the idea of essentially uh, taking these patients out of the hospital um, uh, as fast as we uh, uh, can. And the third area of intense innovation is the uh, uh, area of uh, sensors. And several companies right now are developing very interesting implantable sensors that actually do not really need batteries and essentially can be used for monitoring patients at home at any time, anywhere, everywhere, which is actually can really make a massive impact in uh, our field. So just to actually finalize, I don't really have... Um, uh, closing a slide, uh, other than this, there's never been a better time to be an interventional <coughs> cardiologist. I really think we have an amazing uh, field, as we have seen all over uh, from uh, intelligent uh, imaging and diagnosis to interpretation to new devices that will be developed within the next uh, two decades. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, next speaker is Su Jin Kang in Assam Medical Center, and her topic is machine learning based models for interpreting IVUS. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I have no disclosure. 
Uh, let me get started by talking about the current issues for IVUS analysis. The frame-by-frame -frame analysis takes time and cost and shows high variabilities of measurements. And most studies have used the single-frame derived predictors that do not reflect the whole vessel status. So uh, we need for use of the uh, automated program for whole vessel and whole frame analysis. The, although the traditional statistics provides the regression coefficient, it is still challenging to develop a good prediction models because of the presence of non-linearity between variables and outcomes and interactions among variables. Also, there are too many variables affecting the output. For supervised machine learning, all we need to do is supporting data as input and the labels as output. From weight initialization, the computers titrate each weight by using loss functions in order to minimize the error between the predicted values and the ground truth. So machine learning is a subset of AI that enables computers to learn from data and to make models for themselves. As a subset of machine learning, deep learning is a data-driven approach that is based on a set of algorithms to model high-level abstraction in data. By hierarchical feature extraction with multiple convolutional layers with a, a composed of the nonlinear transformation, a final feature map is generated. And all pixel data of this final feature map are used as input. Then the artificial neural networks with the deep layers classify the result. Because the entire process from feature extraction to the classification by artificial neural networks are automatically performed without any human involvement. The convolutional neural network is called end-to-end -end learning. For automatic IVU segmentation, we have increased the number of training samples with the manual annotation of lumen and vessel at 0.4 millimeter interval. Since 2017, our model has evolved from VGG to ResNet Transformer. That is the final model. And using this model, the performance are excellent for segmentation, both at bifurcation and non-bifurcation segments. In the cohort of the previous trial, there are very close correlation between the AI-derived and human-measured IVUS parameters. Especially the volumetric analysis seemed to be perfect. But in terms of the area measurement at the minimal lumen area site, there are some outliers. That is probably due to the wrong frame selection of minimal lumen area by human measurement at 0.5 millimeter. On the overlay of row and masked images, you can check the status of vessel and lumen segmentation in whole frame. And when the ROI and both reference segments are defined, the all area measurement can be shown frame by frame. And using whole IVUS frames, all volumetric parameters in each segment can be calculated by just a click. And to identify the functionally significant lesions, we extracted 99 IBUS features from the deep learning derived masked images. And the machine learning models, such as L2 penalized largest regression and random forest, show the diagnostic accuracy of 82% for the prediction of FFLS than 0 0.8. Similarly, we extracted the computed angiography features on the diameter plot, and the XGBoost model predicted FFR less than 0 0.80 with the accuracy of 82%. For the deep learning based IVUS plaque characterization, each IVUS frame at 0 0.4 millimeter interval was labeled by the arc of calcification and attenuation. 
the degree-wise label vector were generated for the training of efficient net. And finally, visualized by color-coded map, the extent of calcium and attenuation can be quanti quantified just like as a nearest chemogram. The angle level accuracy was 98%. The inference time per vessel was 8 seconds. The frame level accuracy was 96% for detecting calcification and 93% for attenuation. After co-registration of IVUS and OCT pullbacks, the each IVUS frame at 0.4 millimeter was labeled by the presence or absence of OCT drive the TICFA. And using 1,400 IVUS features based on the 2D geometry, probability distribution, and texture, the machine learning models were developed. Among them, the artificial neural networks showed the diagnostic accuracy of 82% to detect the OCT-derived TIGFA. This study nicely demonstrates the correlation between the pre-procedural IVUS parameters and the degree of stent expansion. However, even with all three parameters, the sensitivity and positive predictive value were less than 30% for predicting stent under expansion. So it is valuable only for exclusion, but not for prediction. As a different approach, that at 0.5 millimeter interval, each frame of a pre-procedural IVUS was labeled by the stent area that was measured at the corresponding frame of the post-stenting IVUS. And using the raw IVUS images and procedural factors, the dense net derived final feature map was generated. When this final feature map and masked image derived IVUS parameters are used as input. The XGBoost classifier predicted the occurrence of stand under expansion with a maximum diagnostic accuracy of 93%. The area under cover was 0.94. The sensitivity and specificity were 85% respectively. The Innovate PCI is a prospective multicenter study, including 3,000 patients with uh, IVUS guided PCI. And the aim of this study is to validate model performances and their clinical impact. The primary endpoint will be two-year target vessel failure. In conclusion, the machine learning is the effective approach for IVU segmentation, plaque characterization, and the detection of ischemia-producing lesions, and the pre-procedural prediction of stand under expansion. And we need for more upgrade of the models for the application to the more uh, complex legion subsets and the stent evaluation. Put it all together, this AI-based solution as a package may help us making clinical decision. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Liang. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I, we're, we'll welcome our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Jung Jun Cha from Korea University Annam Hospital will speak to us about from CFD to AI-based OCT FFR. Uh, Dr. Cha. Yeah, thank you for your kind introduction, Chairman. My name is Jung Jun Cha from uh, Korea University Annam Hospital. My topic is from CFD to AI-based OCT FFR. I am not have any disclosure. So as you know, the based on the deferred frame frame to trial teach us the pressure on ratio under hyperemia means degrees of flow reduction means and degree of ischemia, then we can change the better clinical outcome based on the FFR. So the guideline says that it's recommended for detection ischemia related region when objective evidence of vessel related ischemia is not available. FFR guided PCI is recommended. But there are several pitfalls remain the lack of anatomical information on atherosclerosis using FFR. FFR is just in giving, provide uh, some physiologic information, but not imaging, not uh, region characteristic by imaging. Also, there are technical issues of maximal premia or guiding catheter issue and pressure to signal drift issue is still ongoing. But the technical issue is uh, resolved by the instant wave free ratio IFR and 
IFR is a quite a good correlation with FFR. And uh, there are lots of cases, uh, more than 10,000 cases in IFR Swedish heart deflant flare in both of them. So there are lots of uh, physiological assessments, CT drive the FFR already done, then high parameter ratio that you, we are using FFR and there are lots of uh, method for the IFR, DFR, and other things. And also we using coronary angiography using QFR from predicting FFR. But as you know, the angiography and CT have a low resolution rather than intravascular imaging. So we, in this point, we consider the association between physiologic and region characteristics. So as you see, there are pressure wire basement have a good information for the functional characteristics, but the coronary angiography and coronary intravascular imaging give the region, informa region characteristic information. And uh, as you know, the coronary intravascular imaging have a high resolution image, so it can be better predicting the FFR. So the CFD, computational fluid dynamics and machine learning can be a bridge between the FFR and imaging, physiologic and region characteristics. So I uh, will leave you some uh, articles about the OCT from CFD and the machine learning. So this is the first paper we published in card, uh, circulation cardiovascular intervention and in, we using computational fluid dynamics from the 92 LAD arteries and you using, using the blood flow simulation in a uh, navier stroke equation and we assumed timid frame count for the coronary angiography velocity and also mean breath pressure is also checked. So the 92 LAD was including these studies and 62.7 years old for entire age. And there is a luminal diameter stenosis in about the 60. So the correlation between the FFR OCT by the competence fluid dynamics and invasive FFR is well correlated and coinvasion R is 0.72 and accurate in 88%. And it is more clearly, but just using MLA or area of stenosis. So there are lots of, uh, there are several studies for the CFD-based OCT FFR. This study is uh, compared between QFR and OFR. The QFR is a good option to the predicting FFR by coronary angiography. But as you can see, the OFR, OCT-based driven FFR is more better to predicting the FFR. And this is a quite a large population, 212 vessels in 180 patients. The accuracy is 92% and is a OFR is a good, is a best way to predicting FFR in other, uh, compared to other methodologies. So now we, uh, now we move on the supervised machine learning. You already heard of a Professor Kang or other um, presenters says about the AI. The AI is a big part. The machine learning is a proportion of the AI. We firstly reported the machine learning uh, OCT FFR in the scientific report 2020. So we using in, in situation we 36 features and selected for the machine making the model of the machine learning based OCT FFR. We, in this study we only put the LAD only. So when we uh, put features one by one, then the sixth feature is the most higher Pearson correlation. So we set the six major features for the six these, these features. And there are four features for the OCT parameters and two features baseline characteristics like hypertension or platelet count. So there are good correlation between the clinical FFR and predicted FFR. The advantage of the machine learning FFR is only using two couple of minutes to predicting the FFR value, but the CFD is a needs a supercomputer, so and it about the 20, more than 20 minutes to analyze it, so the predict FFR value, yeah. and the AOC curve is quite good. So we moved on the global model for the three basal type, but uh, interestingly there. 
Is we mm-hmm. we using same model and same methodology to make the model for the machine learning model. And left seven uh, major features are only the OCT model, and there is including the target vessels. So we are testing 72 vessels and external validation also using for the uh, predict, uh, correlation of the co- correlation our model and the FFR. So the baseline is like this, and the result is a correlation FFR is a, uh, comparable with the previous study, the 0.87, and also create is 92, and even the external validation there is a less, more or less than the testing result. So it, it seems that uh, it's some, some over, um, overfitting for this better, but, you, but this is a supervising machine learning, so it um, happen, it can happen, I think. So testing testing data have a good AUC coverage, 0.948, and external validation point data in AUC is at 0.912. So these are conclusions. Intravascular OCT has the highest resolution imaging modality compared with the CT, angiography, and an IBUS. And OCT can provide morphological information about lesion characteristics more accurately to CFT and machine learning method. And CFT or machine learning based OCT FFR derived techniques can be a used method for the evaluation, evaluation the function and the anatomical severity of coronary stenosis. So compared to the CFT based OCT FFR, machine learning has a cost effectiveness and with time saving. So, but uh, CFT or machine learning has still several limitations to apply real clinical practice. Integration of functional and anatomical information may provide better treatment for intermediate coronary artery stenosis. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so we're gonna move to our final speaker, uh, Dr. Young Hak Kim mm-hmm. from Asan Medical Center will uh, give us a lecture on application of AI and robotics for cardiovascular care. Dr. Kim. Thank you. And today, my topic is application of AI in the robotics for cardiovascular care. And this is my closure. I was involved in the establishment of Korean startups producing robotics and medical AI. And the two topics I have, the first one is interventional robotics. Second one is medical AI for assistance of coronary intervention and cardiovascular care. And this was first uh, reported in 2006. And uh, the device was produced by Israel company um, joystick and some motors, they are very similar to currently used one. And uh, this device was used to, to remotely drive a coronary catheter or wire. And basically, uh, the concept was very similar to the current one. And they have hypothesis that uh, this kind of robotic intervention may reduce operator radiation time and reduce the musculoskeletal problem and in this enhanced precision of balloon or stand positioning, and that they think the semi-automatic manipulation would be possible, and uh, uh, they think that it minimizes operator-based bias. And the core path system is now available, and it was uh, approved by uh, US FDA in 2012, and the second generation system is available, and it is being used in the clinical studies, and the company was acquired by Siemens in 2019. And there's one uh, recent report about meta-analysis comparing robotic versus manual PCI. And regarding clinical success, they have had uh, comparable outcomes. And the contrast volume was reduced by robotic PCI compared with manual PCI. And the fluoroscopic time was reduced by robotic PCI. And it was an interesting event. And as you see in the operating room, and the operating room was equipped by robotic PCI device. And the operator uh, was 20 miles away from the operating room, and he manipulated remotely the, the catheter devices. And the connectivity system was land currently used. And I think uh, it is a very conceptual event. And uh, if that wanted to come true in the reality, I think more advancement in the connectivity ICT technology should be done. However, I agree that their idea, and uh, this kind of procedure to be valid in very urgent situation in very big, large countries like India. In India, the size is very big. However, uh, the number of operators is not enough, uh, particularly in the countryside. 
And the Corinthian system was now reading uh, the, the, the area, and uh, recently, and the French company, Robot Cat, was produced, and recently in the Korean start produced Avera 1 and Avera 2. Avera 1 uh, was recently approved by Korean FDA, and it is the first uh, in-man study with the uh, Avera 1 system, and the system was loaded uh, after a geography, and with the, uh, with the haptic device, and I'm driving the wire, as you see, but it is not uh, uh, commercially a better one. And Avair 2 was uh, designed for commercial use. And they have some advantages compared with the priors, and uh, particularly uh, this kind of a special uh, haptic device allows one-hand procedure. Maybe it is used for, for operators. And the complex PCI is also possible with a multi-channel mechanism. And the control model and the smart, smart UI UX may be uh, useful to operator and the assistant in the cat lab. Uh, so multi-center uh, the clinical registry is being planned, and uh, we hope for in the first patient will be enrolled in autumn this year. Second topic is medical AI. <clears throat> uh, today I want to talk about uh, AI QCA. It was produced by Korean staff as well. And I think you everybody agree that QCA is, well, uh, is useful uh, to understand the coronary morphology and the reasons. However, it is not actually performed in the cat lab because it takes a little bit long time. We cannot take the long time in the cat lab. But if you use AI QCA, you can get the whole detailed information of the coronary and the region within a couple of seconds. So, and, and the, the program was trained by more than uh, 10,000 patient data, as you see. Let's see how it works. After angiography, uh, the image is automatically transported to the software, and uh, you can see percent timer stenosis and the luminal lumen ranks and the detailed information within a couple of seconds. Also, in the, you can see um, uh, how long stand uh, uh, that we needed in, the, in covering the region with the software. And the multi-center randomized trial is being planned, and the patients are now being alert and uh, the, they comparing MPXA and the AI QCA system versus OCT guided PCI, 200, uh, 200, 200, 200, and the primary efficacy endpoint is the standard minimal lumen area by OCT estimation, and also we are comparing the clinical outcomes between the two devices. And the upcoming pro program is waiting, it is uh, AI FFR, and it is actually uh, angiography derived FFR, virtual FFR, and the, the system is MPFFR XA, and it is also uh, and, uh, trained with more than 10,000 angiogram. So if you combine both AI QCA and the AI FFR, we can get both morphological and the functional information at a time in the cat lab. Maybe uh, this kind of devices assist your procedure in the cat lab. So currently, now many uh, medical AI programs are available in the area of public health, image analysis, and the clinical trial performance, and the retrieval of medical information and the operational organization. But in the future, not very long future, in the near future, with the more advancement of AI like a chat GPT, generative AI model, maybe you can automatically record your voice and your question, and then maybe you can advise the uh, virtually with the, the, the virtual doctors or virtual assistants. So I think um, uh, robotics and the medical AI is not very far from us. Maybe I think it's, like, it's our time to test the both, ability, uh, both uh, uh, new technologies in our cat lab and or in the clinical settings. Thank you for your attention. Great, thanks so much. Um, I think we've got a few minutes for discussion. Just. So everybody knows there's microphones, um, so if anybody has any, please uh, go up to one of the microphones. And for the panel, please uh, jump in with any questions that you might have. Just uh, while we're waiting, maybe I'll just um, start with the first one. Like, um, I've got a couple of questions. One of them is for Juan. Um, you know, the, this is going to sound crazy, but as you were showing the mitral interventions, like, and then as I was thinking about the lampoon procedure, if you've got tines on your transcatheter mitral valve, could you essentially make those into an electrocautery so that you could 
um, lacerate the anterior mitral leaflet and prevent LVOT obstruction? Could that be combined in that device, or is that too big a feat of engineering right now? It would be a big, a big, um, a massive project, uh, you know, to add on. But um, you, you're actually raising a very good point because right now there's a lot of work in modification of uh, the anterior leaflet with uh, dedicated technologies um, that actually can achieve that in a very simple way. Um, but actually also modifications of the frame to be able to exclude the anterior leaflet as uh, the surgeons actually do during uh, surgery. So that is actually a particular area of innovation right now in which engineers are working on. Do you see that as it's gonna be two sequential procedures or do you think at some point we can integrate into a single? L likely, I mean, one of the things that um, we, we tend to to forget, I mean, it's actually funny how interventional cardiology works. I mean, we innovate and then we just go back and say, oh, these guys are doing it, they were doing it this way for decades. And uh, we started to realize when you talk to the surgeons that actually they've been doing septal modification until leaflet modification always, almost always during these uh, procedures. So um, I, uh, there is right now uh, a new boom in terms of developing technologies that could uh, be used synergistically with uh, the valves, not in all the patients, but actually in the patients that actually would require that. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask, ask a question to Dr. Min. Uh, congratulations on the great work. Uh, excellent application of AI technology into uh, clinical practice. Uh, from your uh, presentation, I imagined a future where we use coronary CT as surrogate marker. Uh, you know, analogy to coronary coronary calcium score, it is, it is really good at risk prediction, risk stratification, but uh, it is hard to use as a surrogate marker. It doesn't regress, and its change doesn't reflect uh, how, we, how well we treated a patient. So do you think we can use it as a risk fact, uh, uh, surrogate marker? And isn't it like we expose patients to too much radiation and contrast dye? It's a good question. So we have, we'll, we're trying to answer that. So, I mean, I think the, when you go back 15, 18 years to the 64 slice CT scanners, there was a fair amount of radiation. But if you use the latest generation technology, you really should be able to get less than one millisievert of radiation in a very high quality diagnostic image. So I think the, the radiation exposure problem is solved uh, if you do it right. Uh, the contrast for people without underlying renal dysfunction is about 60 cc's of contrast, so I don't think that that will cause them harm. Whether it can actually improve your decision making to, um, to improve patient outcomes, that's a big question. Um, everything I know from CT is that the darker the plaque, the more non-calcified it is, the more dangerous it is, and that the calcified plaques all represent stable phenotypes. And that makes sense pathophysiologically because if it's a rock like calcium, then it can't rupture, so it can't cause a heart attack just pathophysiologically. So we, we're, we're going to start a randomized trial later this year, about 8,000 patients, um, true screening trial, um, randomizing patients to usual care versus um, sort of atherosclerosis guided care. So I can tell you the answer in five years, but probably not today. I'll expect it. <laughs> Jim, I think a question in the same, in the same field. Uh, so I think what you presented today is the present, is the way how we're using CT to assess risk based on plaque composition, et cetera. How far are we from, after getting a CT, understanding what is the best treatment approach for that patient? So I imagine the future doing a CT and the referring physician gets a report saying not only the plaque composition, that's very important, but this patient will do better with medical therapy, this patient is for PCI, and this patient is for surgery. What is, what is needed to, to get there? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. I think it's going to be a, a second trial after the one we do, um, because I, what, what I know is that um, dark plaque is bad on a CT, and bright plaque is good, and you can turn dark plaques bright. That's a medical therapy question. You know, we had published, I don't know if actually if we had published it, but we'd created an algorithm where you could take a baseline CT, extract all the features, and figure out whether or not somebody was a statin responder or a statin non-responder. I think those kinds of algorithms are going to come out more and more, and now we've got a very heavy toolbox of therapies, right? PCSK9 inhibitors, and glycerin, GLP-1s, all of that kind of stuff. So I don't think we have the luxury of just treating everybody with everything because there's too many things to do. Who benefits from revascularization? Like, I think if you take like the Courage or ischemia trial, and you made those people 
uh, the eligibility, folks who were refractory to medical therapy, like so you treated them aggressively and 18 months later, they still have all these high-risk lesions and they just aren't changing. I think revascularization of those lesions may reduce events. Like, um, but I think that if you just take a de novo, because it changes over time, right? It's so dynamic. But if you just take somebody at one point in time, I don't think that's enough. I think you take one point in time, treat them aggressively, bring them back, and if they're refractory to medical therapy, I think those are people will benefit from PCI, independent of symptoms. And so, like, if you start to think about the, what I'm saying, like, I think we need to shift away from symptom-guided treatment to disease-focused treatment. And if we can focus on the disease, then I think that P revascularization can save lives. It's just in those people who fail medical therapy. Dr. Min, can I have one question? The other side of your... Sure. Actually, I'm very happy to see one of the Temple Hour as an alumni. Actually, I, I, I already know that you know, your company is, is one of the leader, uh, leader area in the, in the AI, uh, AI field, but uh, I just want to know the, the your data is, is fascinating and, and very uh, promising, but uh, uh, your company product is already, you know, got the uh, cleared the US FDA and then got the CPT code, but uh, how, about the, how about the approaching to the CMS reimbursement system in this time, until this time? Yeah, it's a good question. Like what, I mean, it, when I was in academics, like we put, we do a project and yeah. get on a podium, write a paper, and I thought the job was done, but it's less, <laughs> less than 1% there, right? Because there's all the other stuff, the regulatory stuff, the payer stuff. But, we, we have a national payment classification from, um, from Medicare, U.S. Medicare. Yeah. Um, so now, but there's three, uh, you need the codes, the reimbursement, and yes. the coverage. So we're working through the coverage, the last step of that right now. That's usually a several year effort. So, um, you know, we're about a year into it. And so your entity is B2B or B2C. Actually, I have seen the, your website. The, if we, we will provide the DICOM data of city, we will analyze the, this kind of system. But the, the one of the more interesting thing is, is how about the acceptance rate of city quality? I think that the city quality is very, very important to make you know, good data. It is like, um, so I mean, we, I'll answer this and then I'll try to ask the others because I, I, I can definitely talk to you about the company um, offline. I just want to make sure that we can, I, I don't want it to be a focus on, on oh, yeah. our company, but the, um, we, we reject, I think, less than 2% of the studies. Um, so generally, even dating back to 64 slice, we can analyze them pretty accurate. And if there's an area of the artery that has motion or something, mm -hmm. we can just exclude that portion and then analyze the rest. Um, so generally, uh, most people can analyze. Thank you. But you bring up a really good question. Maybe I can ask Akiko. <clears throat> like, um, you know, Dr. Kim talked about this flash uh, randomized trial. Um, I, I think that's good. It's like, you know, it, it shows a level of evidence that, you know, that proves that this technology is actually work. And we, we saw so much really good sort of technology on OCT-based FFR with these 99% correlation coefficients. I mean, you do so much OCT imaging. At what point of, of evidence do you say, okay, you know, it's good enough, I'm not even going to have a human look at it anymore, or is that never going to happen? I think already it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> and I really would stop drawing the circle. I did almost 20, 30 years, but my, our main focus is really looking for pathophysiology or like the making the direction. Which one should we focus? That's our main purpose. It's not just, not, not just drawing the circle. So I think the drawing the circle, it's already good. I give the AI, no problem. But what is important is we make the priority, what is most important to predict the standard expansion. And then, based on this, we learn more, and now we are focusing the couch node such difference. So, I mean, we are clinicians, and we are looking for the disease. And then, we are looking more something we never thought, and then those new things we are looking for. So, I think like simple things, I think definitely AI should take care of this. And and main question was, what's left? What is a human being should do? That's my main question. And I'm, I'm asking all the, uh, these nice topics, everybody talk, that's nice. And I'm really asking, and what do you think? What is human beings should do now? <laughs> Actually, that's a question I ask myself every morning, like what, what am I doing with my life? So 
I completely understand that. I, I have another question for Dr. Cha, who um, talked about the OCT-based FFR um, and uh, by both fluid dynamics and machine learning. You know, the fluid dynamics just comes with so many assumptions, right, around the boundary conditions, like whether the wall is rigid, driving aortic pressure, microcircuitary resistance. And then, on the other hand, the machine learning models that you showed, all the feature importance was dominated by essentially stenosis, right, percent area stenosis, minimum luminal diameter, lumen area. And so I have two questions. One. Is stenosis just good enough that we don't even need to really measure anything else? And if somebody has chest pain and a stenosis, we should just send them to the cath lab. And two, like, how are you looking at CFD models versus machine learning? Are they complementary to each other? Does one work better than each other? And so on. Uh, so, uh, thank you for your wonderful question. I always one, one, I always thought think think about the questions. The first question is. Uh, the, our study is based on the stable coronary angi artery, uh, stable angina patients, not chest pain, just intermediate coronary artery disease who was checked by coronary CT or other things. So chest pain is uh, one of the major factors for the uh, PCI or medical treatment, but it is not uh, included in this study, so I cannot uh, answer for the questions. And second one is, uh, and, and I want more things. There is a, a stenosis, uh, lumen stenosis is a major, major thing to uh, change the FFR value, I think. But there is uh, some other things we don't know, like the plaque characteristics, like the repeated burden or the fibrous calcified flux makes a difference between uh, FFR value, but we don't know. But the uh, AI makes some way, or machine learning gives some, uh, some thing, some some uh, point to we have to consider about the, that factors. And second one is the CFD and, and machine learning is uh, quite a different thing. The CFD have a lot of assumption, as you said, but the AI is uh, more, lots of information is just gathering up and they build some, uh, some models and make some results for us, then we can interpretation, where, what, what should we do? But the CFD is a more, I think it is more the subjective, subjective con assumption is make some difference in, in result. So we moved on the uh, machine learning studies for, for using lots of information in the region characteristics and to make the improve the patient uh, clinical outcomes uh, rather than CFD. Okay, thank you very much. I, Jim, yeah. can, I, can I ask, because I think that's an important topic, and, and the question is for the panel. Uh, so we have seen all these tools being developed. I'm going to talk specifically about Andrew FFR, OCT FFR, IVOS FFR. And when you look at the validation cohort, it's always 85, 90% accuracy. Now, when it comes to real life, and this has been uh, uh, shown by the team of Professor Newman, Professor Royce, recently in the VPM, it's going to come in, in, in press uh, soon, is the fact that when you test these tools uh, with the patients that we have on the table, the accuracy reaches 70, 75%. <clears throat> so what is the test that these tools must undergo before we really adopt them in clinical practice? What is your feeling about this, uh, the adoption of these tools based on these initial studies? I mean, I can give my response. Like, I, I always told the fellows, if it's a research question worth asking, it's a question worth asking within the context of a prospective multicenter clinical trial. So I think any technology that doesn't have that kind of validation is, and then I get it, like the trials are going to be different. But I, I'm of the ilk that you don't even need non-invasive physiologic imaging. I think you see a stenosis and chest pain, send them to the lab. Like, because I don't think any non-invasive tool has a negative or positive likelihood ratio that's strong enough to drive your posterior probability to anything less than intermediate. So you're stuck no matter what you do. So I, but that's my personal opinion. So happy to hear the others. And we can hear the others offline because we're already five minutes over. Just want to thank the audience and the speakers for this great session. Thank you very much.